This is a day when we can see how quickly things can turn. And we begin with the excitement and the exaltation of the procession into Jerusalem uh, with palms and cries of Hosanna in the highest. And now only, let's see, we started at 10 o'clock. It's now 10 to 11. And already we're seeing Jesus crucified and dead. And normally on a Palm Sunday, we talk quite a bit about humanity and that arc of, of humanity that bends toward this, this uh, self-serving betrayal, this, uh, this evil, the ugliness, the darkness that is in us that needs that Savior, that needs Jesus to come and help us turn it around uh, by transforming us, by transforming humanity altogether. But today, I'd like to refocus us a bit and turn to the epistle to the Philippians that we heard before the reading of, of the Passion. This letter that starts, Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. You see, year after year after year, if you're anything like me, I, you might get kind of pulled into this drama of the, the shift that the people go through. Going from this excitement and this welcoming and all the way to, to the shouts of crucifying them, to, to his death and his burial. But we sometimes lose focus. We, we should be looking at what Jesus himself was doing. That every action that he takes, everything that he does, uh, from, from the, uh, the sending of the disciples out to get the, the donkey, to uh, the Last Supper, to the Garden of Gethsemane, the arrest, the trial, the march to the cross, all of that is done as an act of self-emptying love that you and I are called to imitate. See, I tend to get too focused on feeling guilty, <laughs> uh, which is good in a way, because it's, it's important that we remember uh, that we are sinful and fallen and in need of redemption, that we need uh, to be saved, right? But sometimes that breaks that link between our need and Jesus' ability to, to respond. We get so focused on knowing that we're not perfect, that we forget to connect with that one who perfects humanity by taking it on himself. See, everything that Jesus did, everything that Jesus encountered, could have pulled him away from his path of love. He could have been seduced by uh, that excitement, by that invitation to power, and God knows that he was someone who could have taken it by force. But he was someone who himself was very powerful and completely capable of just railroading in and replacing Rome or replacing the temple or replacing anything he wanted because he truly was and is God. So there's a, a, a temptation, a pulling away of focus that could have happened to him. And then in the, uh, in, in the Last Supper, talking with his disciples, his disciples who were so quick to swear an oath that they would never betray him, not just Peter, but everybody. And meanwhile, Judas is in the process of actively betraying him. And then going on to the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, seeing how his disciples couldn't stay awake long enough for him to pray. And, by the way, as he's praying, asking God to let this cup pass from him, and God not doing it. And we have the affirmation that we heard in last week's reading that God heard him because Jesus was righteous. But that doesn't mean that Jesus got what he wanted. It only meant that Jesus was heard. See, so we have all these distractions that could have pulled Jesus away from that loving act. And then, as if that were not enough, then he gets arrested. And his disciples, who have seen him preach and teach and heal, react with violence, 
cutting off the ear of a slave as he is taken. He puts a stop to it. He submits to the human judiciary system, is put on trial, and that is not an epitome of justice. We see how that has been corrupted. We see that uh, the Roman justice system also betrays him, that, that Pilate can see that, that he is an innocent man and yet will not put a stop to this, this process. Over and over, humanity shows Jesus its worst self, its worst self. And yet Jesus continues on this loving Pilate tries to free him, but instead, at the, at the demand of the people, frees Barabbas. Jesus is tortured. And Jesus is hung on the cross. And Jesus dies. And he does that as an act of love. Every turn, when humanity shows how bad we are, how bad we can be at our worst, he continues on. And that is an example that we are called to follow. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. See, we find plenty of ways to be distracted. Some of them are, are mundane and even humorous. We in our, our worship team have had Lots of ups and downs this week. If you were if you were watching the eight o'clock service, you saw we lost sound, we lost video, we had to start over. Now poor Anthony at the desk is going to be stitching together a Franken liturgy of of uh, what we we can salvage so that there's a right one service at least that's available for people later. And even now, um, we, we thought we had gotten everything ironed out, and yet uh, hopefully you were able to see the video of the gospel but the speaker that we had set up so we could at least hear the gospel didn't work. So we sat in, what, 14 minutes and 23 seconds of reflective silence. See, th those little things, like the, the ceiling creaking here in the church can, can pull our focus away, and those are the small things that distract us from the loving act of worshiping God. There are larger things, aren't there, that distract us from our loving worship of God, when, especially when it comes to showing our love of God by showing our love of humanity, by reaching out to our neighbor, reaching out to our friends and family, yes, but also reaching out to strangers, reaching out to enemies. And we, we use excuses to try to to let us off the hook when it comes to that loving action. We say, oh, well, they don't, they don't deserve it. They haven't worked for it. Or they're my enemy. They hate me. Why would I help them? They don't deserve it. And you know what? Most of the time, you are actually probably right. It is very likely that they, whoever they are, that they don't deserve it. But that's not why we work. That's not why we offer. That's not why we sacrifice. We do it because God invites us to do it because Jesus has already done it. We do it because we are invited to take on the mind of Christ, to be love to this world. And so when it comes down to, do I feed this person? Do I share water with this person? Do I, I work with the, the systems of the world to make the world better? I don't do it for myself. And I'm not speaking of me as an individual. I'm using the, the sort of generic I. I don't do it for myself. I do it for my neighbor, for the other, for the stranger, for my enemy. And why? Because God loves them. And because God has called me to serve them. That me that is called is the human me, not Anne, because I'm not that great. Humanity. God has called all of us to love and serve each other. And it's easy when it's here, when it's people that we like, people that we get along with, people that once the, 
the, the COVID situation is all resolved and we can get back to normal, those people that I want to go have a coffee with or a beer with, those people are easy to serve. Those people, I am happy if they call me in crisis at 2 in the morning, not because they are in crisis, but I'm glad that they reached out. It's a lot harder when there are people that, that don't get along with you. It's a lot harder when there are people whose values don't line up with my values, whose, whose view of the world doesn't line up with my view of the world. And yet, we are called to serve them. To serve people we don't understand, to serve people we don't like, to serve people that want to do us harm because we are following Christ's example. And we do it not because a law says to do it or a church doctrine says to do it, because we've experienced God's love ourselves. And that inspires us to do the same. America is going through a prolonged crisis. And we see that in COVID-19, we can take hope that, that the vaccines are, are becoming more common, that people are receiving them, and we're hoping that that will help move us in a positive direction. But we've also seen how people have reacted poorly. We've seen how people have asserted, demanded that they not wear masks because they don't want to have to. So I ask you, in the midst of that, what is the Christian response? What is the way that we encounter that situation in a way that helps us to be love? Now, I wear my mask not because the governor tells me to or the bishop tells me to or whoever, but because it's an act of love. I support um, uh, what, what people will sometimes call common sense gun laws because I stand against violence against other human beings. And we're seeing that this week is playing out more and more so much of this, the COVID epidemic is a problem, but we see these other problems that expand as well. When we get into debates about what the, the government should do, what the law should do, that's all important conversations to have. But as Christians, our response boils down to how can I be love in the world? And whatever the powers that be do, our response should be a holy response. A response that is, is guided and shaped by the love that God has already shown us. The love that doesn't make sense. The love that is even foolish, foolhardy, nonsense. <laughs> Because there is no logical reason that Jesus would end up on the cross for humans that were doing the crucifixion. There's no reason that Jesus would pray for his murderers as they were murdering him. And yet, he did. And that is who we ought to be. So, as we walk through this Holy Week as we uh, take the, the sort of compressed, condensed version that we saw today on Palm Sunday, and we stretch it out and walk through it more slowly through our liturgies. We should be watching for those actions of love. And let Jesus' actions impress us, make an impression on us, change our shape so that we are better disposed to be love in the world ourselves and stop holding other humans up to human standards to look at them through god's eyes god who made that person god who in, imbued that person with god's own image 
to see that person as a person that is worthy of human dignity, not because they've earned it, but because, because God has ordained it. We have so much work to do. And we will falter, we will get distracted, we will reject Jesus, we will deny Jesus, we will crucify Jesus, we will do all of these things because we are human, but in the background, our foundation, that thing that we rest in always, is that he still loves us. And when we cling to that, we are transformed. And as we are transformed, our actions are transformed, and we can reach out to others to share that blessing. So let's always be getting ready to go out into the world, letting our minds conform to the mind of Christ. So we are prepared to go and be loved.